is uh, a tremendous honor to welcome Professor Matthew Levering. Uh, he is the James N. Jr. and Mary D. Perry Chair of Theology at Mundelein Seminary. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And he's the author of a new book titled The Theology of Robert Barron. How are you today, Matthew? Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So uh, I should like to begin by asking you, um, so what do you observe to be the state of uh, Christianity in contemporary America? Well, you know, I, I think there's, it's pretty good, you know, c compared to the state of Christianity um, in a lot of places, you know, in, in part, in part, the, um, you know, we've had, uh, there's just a number of uh, ecumenical uh elements that that really help um the christian united states you know there are different um there's there's a lot of christians <laughs> in other words you when you know you travel around you meet um you know pentecostals or you meet um evangelicals of some kind you know and, and you meet catholics and and a lot of people really lo love jesus and they they go to they they worship and they identify they read the bible you know, I I don't think it's that bad at all here. You know, um, now now admittedly, uh, of course, um, there you could look at it from another side where there's a, um, a significant decrease in in faith. Faith is not being handed on, and faith is not being communicated. And um, there's it would be you can see a number of problems. So uh, you can look at it from one way or another another side. But I I would really um, emphasize the the positive. You know, right now. So on the basis of that question, uh, why do you believe such a figure like Bishop Robert Barron is uh, necessary today? Oh, well, you know, he's part of handing on the faith and, and every generation has to hand on the faith. You know, so he's done a lot to, um, you know, really try to spread the faith to younger younger people. You know, Bishop Barron, he's probably 63. I think he's 63. I, I can't remember. Is that right? Yeah. He's already sixty-four. I think he's about turned sixty-four. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's his um, you know, his life has been spent trying to hand on the faith and pass it on to um, the next generation, and he's had a lot of impact. You know, and so you you got to have people like that, though. You know, if you're going to be, um, you know, spreading the faith and and getting people interested in Jesus Christ, uh, there, there's plenty of other things to be interested in. So if you're going to spread, if you're going to have any chance of um, you know, continuing on with uh, the whole Christian project, you, you really got to have people like Bishop Barron who um, devote their lives to uh, spreading faith, teaching the faith, um, communicating about Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I would like to pivot from that to the question of uh, why uh, uh, why a book on uh, uh, to why a book systematizing the theology of uh, Bishop Robert Barron is um uh, is being written, and well, why you are the person writing it? Well, in terms of me, I think I think I'm in a good position to write it, um, because you know I'm really I'm really the same theological generation as as Bishop Barron. We we read the same authors, you know, we read the same authors in graduate school. <laughs> You know, so I, even though I'm, I'm probably ten years, I'm ten years younger or whatever. Um, you know, I'm still pretty much the same theological generation because he had he he had his priestly training and so on. It, it just took took him a little bit longer. Um, you know, uh, we're the we're we have a lot in common in terms of how we were educated and the figures of the time. So the you know the '80s and '90s. These figures were all very much alive to me, um, very much part of my um, my own education, and they were big cultural figures at the time. Um, I'm thinking about people like Raymond, Raymond Brown or or um, Andrew Greeley. Uh, these are these are major major figures for for my own uh, period of formation. Also Stanley Harawas, Alistair McIntyre. You know, um, so Bishop Barry and I have a lot of co in common there, and. I was interested then in this book, you know, uh, just 
just trying to contextualize Bishop Barron's project, you know, essentially contextualizing the project. And, and so that was really the purpose, you know, is say kind of like, okay, what, what is he saying? What are his key themes? What are the key points in as he communicates the faith? And and then also trying to contextualize, um, you know, his work um, in, in its influence and in, the, in its um, or, origin or sources, you know. <laughs> Yes, and uh, you and I share uh, one thing in common in that we find great value in the theology or the philosophy of Alistair McIntyre. I a few months ago I read uh, After Virtue, and um, it has become my favorite read of the year, and I find myself uh, profoundly influenced by his thinking. And like McIntyre, I'm also a convert to Catholicism. Mm. Yeah, as am I. And so, yeah, no, I, I know I got to know Alistair McIntyre, um, you know, when I spent a year at Notre Dame in, in 2006, seven. So my my so-called office, I didn't really have an office, but where I worked was right down the hall from Alistair McIntyre's office. So, um, yeah, no, he's but he but I've read his work already, um, you know, in the in the mid 1990s. And of course, that that greatly influenced Bishop Barron as well. You know, um, yeah, this this context it's very important because in the Catholic world, um, the Catholics here in the United States were um, were essentially rebuilding or rethinking after Vatican II. You know, the the 1970s, um, you know, had had offered a particular path. Um, Catholicism in the 1970s was sort of divided. You know, you had um, different responses to Vatican II. Um, and neither rich response was was particularly rich. In my opinion, and so that's how, that's what Baron felt. Baron felt that um, uh, you know, as Baron sort of came of age in the, you know, and became became an intellectual. This was the this by now. I'm thinking like um, the mid '80s, late '80s, early '90s. You know, Baron sort of coming of age, and he's saying, "Look, you know, um, neither the project of of religious liberalism and its Catholic version." You know, nor the project of like um, traditionalist Catholicism with a capital T. You know, neither of these is um, is going to really help us. We need to, we need to, we need to sort of rebuild. Let's let's get back to the let's rebuild and rethink here a bit. And so, you know, he was dealing with that sort of polarization, and and I experienced myself. I experienced that polarization when I became, you know, when I became Catholic, which is right after college. I saw the polarization. And um, now, you know, and I also saw how how John Paul II was um, crafting a um, what I would call like a middle ground. You know, he was very much um, in love with Vatican II, uh, but he did not he did not follow the religiously liberal Catholic version of the reception of Vatican II. Um, instead, he instead he kind of gave a vision that was uh, tremendously inspiring to not only to me, but to to many, many, many young people. Um, and it also really connected, connected um, Catholic life with the, with the past, with the great saints, with the great teachers, you know, with Jesus Christ, with the gospels, you know, it was really quite, quite heartening. And, and Bishop Barron was, was part of that, um, that period. He, he was, he was thinking along the same lines as John Paul II, and um, you know, it was an interesting period, the the mid nineties, mid nineteen nineties. Yeah, very few people were were um, like were teaching Aquinas, were reading Aquinas. Very few people were, um, you know, it's just a different a different world, a different world. Like Balazar was beginning to be read in nineteen ninety five in graduate school. Uh, when I went to graduate school, which was, I began in nineteen um, ninety six, um, and at Boston College. But when I began there, nobody at Boston College taught. Ba taught Balzar. There was never a course on Balzar. There was no course on De Labach or anything like that. You know, there was, um, you could do, you know, you could do Rahner or Skillabeeks. Um, you could do Lonergan. You know, if you, if you wanted to read Ratzinger back in that time, it was a, a different world. If you wanted to read Ratzinger, you, you would basically, you need to read Ratzinger in a brown paper bag. bag. Ratzinger was considered awful, you know, because he was thought of as like the, um, the henchman of, of John Paul II, you know, it was, this was a different world. You know, it wasn't, um, you know, like people, t people today, young people today, they kind of think, 
I kind of think in 1996, we were all just sitting there, you know, reading Ratzinger in the Communio crowd and and um, Thomas. There weren't any, there were hardly any Thomas. There were a few, a couple, you know, but but bar barely any. I'm talking about the USA. And and so Baring comes in and, and he writes, he writes that dissertation, but then he writes this book, Thomas Quine's Spiritual Master. And and that book was tremendously valued. It was, it, you know, it was a, it was just such a rich and exciting, um, you know, pop, it was a very it communicated very, very well. It was a very beautifully written book, uh, could easily read. You know, it was a, it was an introduction to theology um, rooted in Aquinas, but also rooted in Barron's own creativity. You know, so it was a very exciting thing. You know, there there, there wasn't there wasn't much like that at the time. You know, Barron was was building from the from kind of the ground up. <laughs> yes, um, when I um, look at a Bishop Barron video. Um, I think uh, my mind in instantly comes to uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen of the 20th century. So uh, I wonder, would it be fair to make comparisons between uh, Bishop Barron and Bishop Sheen? Uh, yeah, I think so. Now, now, in my opinion, um, you know, in my opinion, Bishop Barron is the greater mind. <laughs> I, I think so, at least from. I've read some of Bishop Sheen's books, and in my opinion, Barron is a greater mind. He's he's dealt um, in a more in a kind of more um, robust way with um, more more sources of the faith and so on. So so I think I think Barron's a greater mind, but but you know, uh, Fulton Sheen may may have been um, the greater communicator. Uh, now Barron Bishop Barron is a great communicator too, but um, Fulton Sheen was an amazing an amazing communicator. Um, just so unusual. You know, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. So Fulton Sheen, and it could be. I think a comparison with Fulton Sheen is is quite possible. And and, and Bishop Barron, um, you know, himself, you know, recognizes that he's he's not not um, trying to run away from that at all. He's in fact would embrace it. You know, um, and so he he really likes he he likes what Fulton Sheen tried to do, which was to to spread the faith um, in in a very powerful way and. So, yeah, that's a, the comparison definitely can be made for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, Fulton Sheen's medium is obviously the television, and uh, Bishop Barron's medium is the internet. And of mm -hmm. all the, uh, I guess, um, internet clerics, uh, Barron is certainly one of the most successful. So, um, how did uh, how did the bishop uh, manage to make use of? Uh, this uh, emerging technology, now you know, ubiquitous technology, in order to spread the word. Well, you know, it. it I mean, the whole thing, the whole story. I'm, I, I'm get, I'm a little vague on details, so I may get a detail or two wrong. But, but I know the basic story, you know. And and Baron, Baron starts off. I don't know. He's either radio or with a little TV. I think he was on WGN, which is a TV channel. You you, you can check this after the, after the, our podcast. But he starts off with small things, you know, like he's he's goes around preaching and people just tell him, "Look, you got a gift. You got a gift. You got to um got to share this." So I, I, I if I remember correctly, he was on the radio and then he was on um then he spread to preaching, you know, through a a little t television uh, at WGN, but I may be getting getting it wrong. He may have just been radio, or he may just have been <laughs> may just have been WGN. Anyway, um, main point is that he he just was encouraged. You know, people in the Chicago area just encouraged him and said, "Look, you've you've got a gift to spread the gospel." And he knew he was an intellectual, um, but he he admired he admired people like Andrew Greeley. Greeley was this great, great Chicago figure, you know, full of full of um, you know, Irish enthusiasm, you know, who would write these romance novels and and just Greeley really was a, a character. But Greeley would get on and and he would go on the Phil Donahue show, which was like Oprah Winfrey at the time, and Greeley would go on and and spread the gospel and and all this. Greeley was more on the on the Catholic left. But but um you know Barron got to know got to know Greeley at you know as a young um young you know as a young man. Yeah, you know, during his uh, early priesthood and and so on, and so this was this was an important influence. And so so Baron uh, begins then kind of thinking about word on fire, and and he doesn't really think of it at the early times 
uh, look, I'm no, I'm no expert on Barron, but in terms of this, I, I know his theology better than I do all this, but uh, in his early times, I remember talking to him about Word on Fire. I talked to him about it, and, and in his er the early period, he didn't really think of it, because I met him in 2003. Um, in the early period, I, I don't think he thought of it so much as a, um, some kind of internet thing, you know, <laughs> because he was he was kind of focused on doing this series called Catholicism, and which became fairly well known. It, it was a, it was more like crafting movies or, you know, and then he would just do like these short little talks that he put onto YouTube, but, you know, and, or wherever, I guess it was YouTube, but, but he began kind of thinking that the centerpiece would be like doing these movies like Catholicism, you know, and getting them put on TV, you know, because Catholicism got put on like um, PBS, some version, you know, in some parts, PBS is our public broadcasting, you know, in some channels picked up this, uh, this mini series, like kind of like documentary, like Kent, think of the documentary um, uh, uh, maker, Ken Burns. Ken Burns was a big figure in the 1990s here. He did a documentary on um, Civil War, 80s and 90s. He did the documentary on Civil War, a documentary on um, baseball. And Ken Burns was a big, a big guy. And so, so Barron was looking to see like, how, how can he help spread the faith? Because, because essentially, um, you know, everybody was, people were leaving the church and leaving Christianity, even though Christianity in, in America is um, still much more uh, robust, you know, than in some areas like Europe. But so Baron was thinking, like, how do we spread the faith here in Chicago? You know, because Chicago was an area where people were leaving the faith. So Baron got excited with these things. He didn't begin as a, my point is he didn't begin as an internet guy. He began more as like, let's craft some documentaries. Let's craft some serious um documentaries where we go around and, and show people Catholic art, show people Catholic culture, show people the origins of our faith and the history of our faith, and get people excited in a way that really educates people. You know, he didn't he didn't start off as some kind of internet pundit. You know, no, he's a, he was a very serious theologian, a very serious, um, you know, person who, um, you know, people recognize his talent, you know, and, and he contributed important books and and um and then but you know by the but word on fire eventually um really begins to pick up steam and, and at that point um it became clear that the internet you know was where people were getting a lot of their they weren't looking at tv as much anymore you know people were um going straight to the internet you know straight to youtube or whatever and they were just getting their their knowledge in that way and so baron met them there you know, he made a choice. He he made a choice to really focus, you know, on on internet on meeting people where they were gonna gonna be. You know, um, so it wasn't any longer PBS. He no longer really tried to do, you know, he I don't know if you're familiar, but after Catholicism, he he really tried to build up a series which was called Pivotal Players, and um, Pivotal Players was just trying to take people back into the depth, like the key Catholic thinkers, like these incredible important fingers about Christianity. And so, you know, pivotal players, pivotal players was a was a pretty good thing. But but Baron just he decided he he didn't continue this direction. He 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 decided to focus uh, more on the internet um you know um podcasts. I mean now he does a bunch of podcasts. <laughs> you know, so uh and and podcasts are just for like you know that kind of caught on. So Baron Baron's flexible. That's my point is that he's willing to spread the gospel in all sorts of ways, including by writing very serious books that he's continues to do, to do. You know he's got a good book out um, recently. You know just introducing people to the Old Testament. You know which is so crucial because um, you, you really can't be a Christian if you if you don't really, if you have no no knowledge of the background of our Lord Jesus Christ um, with God's covenants with Israel and so on. So anyway. Yes. Um, so I know that you've alluded to this earlier, but um, uh, tell me about how uh, Robert Barron managed to chart a middle course between this post-Vatican II divide between the traditionalists and the liberals. Yeah, yeah. So, so the liberals after Vatican II, it's it's important to see they they had an agenda. Um, you know, the agenda would be like, um, you know, women priests, kind of more democracy in the church. Um, you know, vote voting and participation. You you know, elect the bishop, elect elect the pope. They they wanted um they wanted the the um 
the permanent synod of bishops. They wanted the synod of bishops to be, become the thing that elected the pope, and then also they wanted the synod of bishops to be able to to um, correct the correct the pope or to um, you know you know reject the pope. They didn't want the pope to have any sort of um, you know strong power. Uh, they wanted um, a change in all the church's uh, moral teachings, um, pretty much focusing on the sexual teachings first. They they wanted um, you know a strong openness to the sexual revolution. Uh, but then there was a number of other things. They they wanted um, a re a new understanding of of dogma, you know, so that dogma would um, be much more flexible, much more fungible, and so you could you could reverse dogma, you could change you could change doctrine and some things. So in general, in in religiously liberal Catholic theology, which is a version of religiously liberal Protestant theology, uh, you know, you can you can sort of change the ideas, the ideas that you can change um, dogma. Um, you, you don't have to, the council trend is no longer, you don't have to sort of follow the council trend. You know, if the council trend very solemnly teaches that the Eucharist is a sacrifice, well, the, the council trend may have taught that at the time, but you can change it now. It doesn't have to be that way in the future. In other words, um, you don't need to have any, any the whole notion of the Eucharist is sacrifice, you can get rid of that. You can get rid of all sorts of things. Um, papal infallibility, you can get rid of that. Um, and and so on, um, including a number of the Marian do dogmas. But the point is that it's that religiously liberal Catholicism is sort of a way of doctrine. In fact, um, considers you know you can reverse doctrine, but instead it's focused um, it's focused on. Uh, two things. One, one is sort of the the gesturing toward the mystery, the mystery of being, you know, the ground of being, and then the other would be, um, you know, building up authentic community, um, where the idea is that that um, social justice, ecology, um, population control, th these were all the things that were, um, you know, liberation from patriarchal oppression, um, uh, you know, socialism, Marxism, liberation theology. So, so these were the type of things. Anyway, um, it's it's a version really of this of um, Protestant religious liberalism, and it's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. But so that was the that was what you called the liberal uh, side. So so Baron Baron um, did not follow that. He he thought too much has been lost here. You know, I mean, the Catholic the Catholic truths about our, our faith, the truths about uh, taught at Trent or taught the truths taught at the councils um, are, are deeply uh, precious, you know, because um, they reflect the reality of, of Jesus Christ, the reality of the Trinity, the reality of um, salvation from sin and death and so on, um, the reality of beatitude, um, the reality of um, the life of grace, the life of virtue, and, and so on. So Barron goes in, he doesn't follow the um, religiously liberal path. Although he takes some elements, he takes some elements from it. But then um, the traditionalist path at that time essentially rejected Vatican II. So the liberal path um, doesn't like the documents of Vatican II, but, but what I loved about the liberal path, the liberal path really loves about Vatican II, um, the element of change. And so especially like things like Dignitatis Humanae or, um, you know, this is on, or it's, um, any changes in the liturgy, you know, the, the liberal path really loves the sense of change. We can change anything you know um let's let's get the church um let's build it up into something uh radically different which will in the end really be just as um, pretty much the episcopalian church uh, that's what that's what the aim is um anyway so uh, a certain version of the episcopalian church so um so that's kind of liberal path now the tr traditionalist path rejects vatican ii and um the liberal path rejects the documents but not the spirit um, the traditionalist path rejects rejects Vatican II as a tremendous mistake, you know, and so, you know, rejects the changes in the liturgy, but just thinks that everything about Vatican II really was just a tremendous error. And so, so Barron just, I mean, and and the traditionalist path is very negative, can be very negative, can sound very, um, uh, just, I mean, everything is. Uh, and Bar and Bar anyway, so Barron doesn't go that direction either. He he was looking for something. Um, that challenges both paths, you know, as it were, he thinks there's a better way. And so that's part of his early writing. You know, his early his early teaching and writing focus on, on that. He 
calls he has a name for liberal Catholicism. He calls it beige Catholicism, mm -hmm. and he says that it it has dumbed every dumbed everything down. Everything is the color beige. There's no nothing bold, nothing nothing um, that would really attract your um, your your eye. You know, nothing bold. It all looks like the culture. It's just, it's just boring. And he just finds liberal Catholicism to be totally boring and is cut off from the Catholic past and from the Bible. And he just finds it to be completely dull. But that's beige Catholicism or like dumbed down. He calls it dumbed down. Or he also calls it um, banners and balloons Catholicism because that was that was how it was expressed in the in the 70s. You know, people put up banners and balloons, um, you know, in the um, worship space and so on. OK, so that's. He, he 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 doesn't like that. But on the other hand, the traditionalist Catholicism, you know, for him uh, is is not um, acceptable either because he he thinks there what you have is a sort of anti-intellectualism. You know, in other words, um, not not allowing Catholicism. I mean, as it were, going going back to some particular um, past moment, not allowing. Um, the evident good things in Vatican II to um, to shape the Church of, of today. Now, now Barron doesn't he doesn't um, detail his criticism of traditional traditionalists um, all that much. He does. He I don't know. So I I don't really spend that much time on his criticism of traditionalists in in the book. Um, but you know, look at the time at the time um, the traditionalists tended to be. Um, you know, they were the Lefebvre rights or, you know, um, they were, a lot of the issues were liturgical. You know, Barron's Baron's main point has always been like Jesus Christ and and can we proclaim Jesus Christ? You know, he he, he fell in love in deep way with the, with the Lord. And so, you know, Barron gets a little bit bored if, if you're just talking only about, um, you know, issues, issues that, that um and, and well and another thing I should say is like Barron's all, also thinks that hey to be a Catholic you gotta be you know you can't be separated from the Pope you gotta you know you I don't know Barron was just was never really interested intellectually in in traditionalism it, it seemed um you know kind of like a museum reinvention of of like what it means to be Catholic Barron just wanted to be Catholic you know and so he he didn't want to. He didn't want to give Vatican II to the religious liberals. You know, Vatican II was his council. You know, and he he just Baron just wanted to be Catholic, uh, is how I would put it. But again, he doesn't really have to. Um, you know, to get into the wars with traditionalism that much in his early work. He just mentions it. You know, and, and gives a, an example or two of why he thinks it's why he thinks it's kind of boring. It's not. It's not. Um, challenging enough you know in part some of the examples he gives are like um dorothy day um that kind of thing you know baron you know dorothy day was a radical you know she was somewhat crazy in a way and you know baron loved dorothy day and he just thinks that she understood that jesus christ and the holy eucharist and the sacred sacred teachings she poured her life out for that and she just she poured her life out for caring for people concrete people, you know, like the person in front of her, you know, and for him, for Baron, this was, this was great. You know, Baron, Baron loved this stuff. He, he loved that far more than somebody who was, you know, running around, you know, being, I, I don't know, his vision of traditionalists, you know, um, but he doesn't really spell out the traditionalists all that much in his writings. Um, he just assumes people will know he's talking about more of the right leaning uh, folks. People back in the '70s knew what he was talking about. In the in the '80s, by by the 1990s, though, you, things really were changing in the church. Um, it it was becoming things were becoming different, and so so uh, you know now nowadays nowadays sometimes people would see like someone like Cardinal George. You would think of him. He was a conservative cardinal. But but he wasn't he wasn't Baron saw immediately that that Colonel George really loved Jesus he loved proclaiming Jesus he loved talking about Jesus he loved talking about the realities of our faith he he wasn't actually so conservative he never he never cracked down he wasn't some sort of guy running around cracking down on anybody 
you know, so to call him a conservative in some negative pejorative sense would be uh, quite quite mistaken. But my point, I, I, I mentioned Cardinal George because as soon as Cardinal George gets to Chicago, Barron sees Barron sees the intellectual power and kind of the um, evangelizing, uh, you know, gift that Cardinal George had. And so by that time, you know, Barron says, you know, this is good stuff. Yeah, um, Cardinal George was no traditionalist, although now he would be thought of as sort of a conservative in some negative way. He was he wasn't at all. And so, anyway, he shows up at Chicago, um, and Barron's Barron really is attracted to that vision. To that, um, and this is by the, I think about the late nineteen nineties. You know, um, I think um, you, I would be very much interested in you know. Uh, getting into the intellectual and theological influences of Robert Barron, but unfortunately we don't have uh, three hours. Uh, but I like to ask this: um, I think um, in every sermon, every podcast that he that you know he appears in or he hosts, uh, he quotes from a wide range of thinkers: um, you know, Aquinas, um, uh, Hasdor von Balthasar, and even Protestant. Uh, theologians like Paul Tillich. Now, how now for someone mm -hmm. of that intellectual capacity, he could have chosen to be well a professional theologian or um, a seminarian, but he chose the path of a clergyman. So, how can someone draw from such a well of intellectual influence without sounding uh, like a professional professional theologian or a seminarian, but well a priest? Well, you know, um, with Barron, he was always like that. He always had the gift. I mean, I might remember he he was a professional theologian, mm -hmm. and in fact, it, if my memory serves, he was offered a position at at Catholic University of America. He was he was offered a full full time you know tenure tenure track position at Catholic University of America, where he would be just a professor. You know, but but Carl and George said no. <laughs> Cardinal George, this is my memory now. I don't know if it's completely accurate, but this is what I I remember. It's like Cardinal George said, no, we're not going to let you go to CUA. You're going to stay here, <laughs> you know? And so good old Cardinal George. And so, um, and the rest kind of was history. Now, now Barron was never like your, your regular um, university type uh, or even seminary professor type. Barron was a communicator. So I invited him to a scholarly conference, and this was in 2003, and he came and gave a great paper, but I, I immediately recognized this guy's not like the rest of us in a way. You know, there are many prominent people there. Avery Dulles was there, and many, many other very prominent theologians were there. Barron easily held his own, and of course, was a great theologian. Um, but but I could tell there was something different about Barron. You know, um, I mean, he was he was just a, he was just a professor at that time. He was a professor at at Mundelein Seminary, writing writing books like the rest of us. But there's something different about him. He really wanted to communicate the faith um, in a in a broad way, and he just had that gift uh, that gift of public speaking. You know, you're you're born with it. He he had that gift. It was a, it was um, you could see it. You know, I mean, this was uh, 20 years ago, but but you could see how special the gift was. So. You know, in God's providence, um, you know, he he gradually devoted more time. And and Cardinal George was a was a key figure here because Cardinal George kind of said, Hey, hey, you gotta you gotta work on evangelization. You know, you gotta, you gotta, um, and he got Baron sort of started up as kind of like Baron, you gotta, you gotta be our evangelization evangelization guy, you gotta spread the faith. So I think that was um that was part of the way that Word on Fire got sort of motivated or inspired. But now remember, um, Cardinal George never gave a penny. He didn't give a penny to Word on Fire. You know, so Cardinal George would start these things, but he would never give him any money, really, because he didn't have any money, you know, to give. And so Barron, Barron though, had a knack for for raising money, and he just was able to do it. And uh, and and kind of the rest is history. He's, like I said before, <laughs> I I don't know if I answered your question well enough, but but Barron was a professor. And he was a respected professor, but he was never exactly like other professors. 
I don't, I don't know how to say it, but it, it was really because you could see that he had this incredible talent for communicating, you know, and it was just so visible um, in him as I'm talking 20 years ago as a, as a fairly young man, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And of course, the second dimension of uh, Bishop Barron's theology that I would like to discuss is the spiritual dimensions of, of uh, his Catholicism, or at least what mm -hmm makes his Catholicism as non-beige as possible. And he would allude to um, figures like, uh, again, Dorothy Day or uh, St. Teresa of Calcutta and people like Maximilian Kobe, who you know, we would not recognize as scholars or you know, Catholic theologians, mm -hmm. but they possess in them an immense amount of, of spiritual energy and spiritual vigor. Mm -hmm. And... I get the sense that for Baron, um, we should not think of them as, you know, as extraordinary human beings, but as people that we can aspire to as apostles. Am I would I be mm -hmm. correct in that assessment? Yeah, I think I think so. You know, and and Baron, in his understanding of moral theology, you know, he's always um, kind of trying to be really concrete. So he he takes up the from St. Thomas Aquinas, he takes the understanding of the infused virtues or the supernatural virtues, not only faith, hope, and love, but also, also infused or supernatural prudence, justice, temperance, and courage. And so Barron talks about these things, but he talks about them in a very concrete way. He gives examples from particular lives of particular saints of, you know, for like infused courage or infused temperance. He gives a specific example um, he does. He does. Kind of describes a, a saint's life and says, "This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like." And this is um, this person had infused justice, you know. And he explains how how that was, and um, he he kind of shows you. And, and once you're done, when you're when you're done reading this particular life, you say, you know, you know this this kind of life could be lived. You know, we we could we could live this life. Um, that's that's a key element to, to Barron's um, moral theology that we don't have to settle, you know, we don't have to settle for living, um, you know, a second rate life. You know, we we could live this life, and he kind of gives us these examples, you know, that um, God God's calling us to um, to live this kind of life um, in Christ, you know, by the power by the grace of the Holy Spirit, and he shows us these examples, but they come alive in a way that makes us see that these are regular people there you know in other words um you know the the saints that he identifies once he once he's done describing them you you do see that these are regular people these these are um, people like you and me and one example is Edith Stein you know he loves Edith Stein um when you read about her life you know she was a professor you know Baron's a professor <laughs> you know what I mean like these are, you know she lived a normal life in a way um but she did something extraordinary and and she she is extraordinary in a, a set of ways. Well, and so Baron is, and that, and his understanding of the spiritual life, he always warns against kind of um some vague um spirituality where you sort of where you're sort of like related to the to the to absolute mystery. You sort of gesture toward the mystery. You know, Baron's always really emphasizing that hey, you know, the spiritual life is about being related to not just to the mystery, but to Jesus Christ, you know, to the living Trinity, to the living Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it's and the way the spiritual life works, Baron, Baron says, you know, is um through concrete embodied practices and and sort of even even the even um the clothing we wear, you know, or so things like that. You know, take for example, let me give you an example that when when Baron got um when Baron first began to teach here at Mundelein Seminary, this was like, this was in 1992, you know, nobody, nobody wore clericals, you know, nobody, nobody would wear um, any sort of clerical garb, no, no priest would, certainly no seminarian. But what happened though was that the seminarians got mad <laughs> and they said, look, we want to stand out. We want to, we want to witness to Christ. So they, they insisted upon wearing, um, you know, some sort of clerical and so the professors then had to join in, you know. And so this is this fits with Barron's own spiritual 
vision of what spirituality is. Spirituality is like these embodied practices, like works of mercy. You know, works of mercy are, are involved. That's what spirituality is. It's concrete. It's concrete. So he thinks also of prayer as very concrete, like the rosary, you know, just concrete things, not, not to some sort of vague um, gesturing toward um, absolute mystery or some um, vague attunement, you know, with being, you, you see what I mean? It's very personal, very in um, soul body, you know, not does, not does um like, uh, you know, um, not just chicken soup for the soul, but but um, soul soul body. Um, anyway, um, these are some things that are important to Baron for sure, and in his own personal life, very important. Um, I think Bishop Baron has made it explicit in multiple occasions uh, that he one of the one of the many things he would he would like to do is to engage with. Um, with the seculars and the atheists. And I'm reminded of that passage in the Gospels where Christ says, uh, you know, I came not to tend to, I came to tend to the sick, but not, and not to the well. Um, so um, how important is, how important is it is to engage not just to the believers, but to the nuns also? Well, obviously that's that's crucial because um it's a matter of spreading the faith because the the nuns um you know usually some of them many of them are are uh, ex Catholics anyway young young ex Catholics you know so when when Baron is speaking to the so called nuns he's he's really speaking to people who went oftentimes they went to Catholic college Catholic high school but but they did not get um like basic um Catholic education and philosophy or theology they just they didn't get anything so they don't really know they don't know that much i mean it's kind of like a tragedy so so baron baron goes right to him you know and in but in a winning fashion he's never he's never negative his he doesn't really have a negative um bone a negative bone in his body a negative spirit he doesn't have that you know he's generally kind of like, like a um like a uh, more you know, he's a realist. He's he's a realist, but he's generally sort of a happy a happy guy. You know, um, and so, uh, so Baron just come comes to these folks like at Google or Facebook. Many of, he does he did two well known lectures there, um, but he's open. Baron is an open. He's a listener kind of guy. You know, so if people come to him with questions and they say, "Hey, how, how can you say that? How can you how can you think that?" Baron, Baron really listens. You know, he wants to know what's wrong with his argument. He wants to know what are better arguments. And so oftentimes, though, when he's um, addressing the nuns, he he builds upon his background in St. Thomas Aquinas because he he got this he got this great training in St. Thomas Aquinas as a master student at Cal University of America in the early, in the early 80s. And so Baron Baron then gives them some reasons from he'll he'll build what he'll use um, Plato he'll use beauty he'll use Plato um, all sorts of things from the philosophical tradition but he'll also use um, you know Aquinas and the five ways and he'll he'll use um, Aquinas's ways of thinking about God and talking about God um, in and Aquinas's understanding also of um, what what religious um, discourse or religious language or religious like talking about religion you know Aquinas remember is famous for being so serene uh, Aquinas doesn't usually like attack his opponents he he puts his the best arguments of his opponents those are the first part of his his article he gives the best arguments as best he can find and then he gives his own argument um, but he does he's not polemical you know in the sense of trying to um you know, destroy others or win points or something like that. He's, you know, it's it's very serene. So, Baron sees that as a model of um of religious um, discourse and and then also things like the five ways or or Plato. These these things are sort of ways of introducing people to what it means to think religiously. You know, to think as a Christian, but then also kind of like sort of basic preambles to the faith. You know, ba basic and important preambles. So um, Baron's, you know, very, very good at presenting, um, you know, th that that wisdom, things that things that back in the, in the past, people would would get that in their college years. 
you know, um, in the in the past at Catholic university, at Catholic universities, you would you would learn these things in college, but um, you don't. They generally people don't learn them anymore, uh, and and so Barron's kind of filling that gap, you know. One of the things that I find really admirable about Bishop Barron is that he makes recurring visits to the internet website Reddit, which, uh, you know, if uh, for, for those who do not know, it does live up to the reputation of being the Sodom and Gomorrah of the internet. There are worse sites for sure, but that one is certainly not one of the best, so to speak. And I'm, I'm reminded about how, again, how Christ would visit uh, tax collectors and and sinners to to preach his gospel and preach his coming, and and it perhaps um perhaps he believes that there the places that want him there the least is the place that need his message his gifts the most. Don't you agree? It could be so. I mean, you know, Bar Baron's ready to, for a conversation, you know, with he enjoys um, a conversation about, um, you know, God or Jesus or, I mean, he's a learner, you know, he's a learner. So he really is open. He's open to learning. He he actually, the thing about him, Baron is that he goes on to Reddit and he's really not there just to argue. He also wants to learn what, are, why are people, why do people say they don't like Christianity? <laughs> you know, he really wants to learn. You know, it's like, why, what is it? What are they saying? You know, why don't they, why do they claim to not like Christianity? Do they know anything about Christianity? But he's not there solely just to, he's not there to judge them. He's there actually to learn, like, what are their reasons? What is, what is, um, what's going on here? You know, and so in a positive way, he wants to learn. He, and he wants them to, um, you know, to see whether, whether their questions, um, you know, could be answered in, in some sort of, in some sort of dialogue, some sort of conversation, where there could be, um, you know, mutual learning, where he he would learn from their questions, and they would learn from, you know, they would learn from um, the knowledge that he has gained, um, you know, through through his study or, or this through his own, um, you know, um, intellectual uh, labors. But so, yeah, I mean, the, the funny thing about about Robert Barron is that he likes to go onto these sites where people are attacking Christianity. But he doesn't go on there as like some triumphal victor. He goes on there because he's really interested in well, what are the questions? <laughs> you know, what what is blocking people? Why why aren't because when you think about it, the gospel is incredibly good news. Um, because what the gospel says is that God is triune, infinite love. God is a communion of love. God is inf God God is filled with mercy. God loves um, His people. You know, God loves the whole human race. God is filled with mercy, so much mercy for us. Um, God wants to redeem us from and free us from, from sin and from death. And God wants us to dwell eternally in, in absolute joy, discovering the mysteries of God, you know, embracing and living in the mystery of God, the, the mystery, mystery because he's infinite goodness, infinite love, infinite wisdom. You know, so it's pretty good stuff here. I mean, compare it like with like eternal death and annihilation and 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 um, you know, kind of, you know, human history. Human history, of course, is filled with um, victims and um, suffering and sin. You know, um, compared to alternative visions, Christianity is incredibly beautiful, but it is also quite radical in the sense that um, that it does call us into. A share in in God's own life, and God is holy. God, in the sense that um, you know, sin is a serious business. You know, um, sin really hurts us. It hurts other people. You know, um, it hurts us. And so, for for Christianity, serious sin is serious. And so that's that's kind of like the, that is a hard that can be a hard thing for some people, um, perhaps. But Baron Baron loves to get in there and and learn. And and then um, he rejoices in the gospel. He loves it, you know. Right. So, um, uh, you've mentioned the the name of his ministry, uh, Wood on Fire, uh, earlier. Uh, what do you believe it means? Uh, when Word on Fire, when he came up with Word on Fire, you know, he talks about um, that. I forget. 
was it was it was it Father Steve Grunau? You know, they're they're sort of brainstorming. He he describes it in the interview book that he did with um John Allen. And they were sort of like brainstorming, you know, and and Baron, I think I don't remember exactly what he wrote what he said about this, but it's something like, you know, Baron knows that he wants it to be something about the word of God, the um, you know, the word of God. He loves, he loves the word of God. He he really loves Jesus Christ as the whole story of Israel, the whole story of creation, of Israel, of all those crazy sinners, uh, you know, Israel's kings and and the covenants, you know, that God makes of um, demonstrating God's love, but also God's gift of the law, God's gift of all these wonderful things God's gift, and also the the symbolic sacrifices, you know, um, the the cultic worship and the temple, all these things with their incredibly rich symbolism. You know, Baron loves all this stuff, and he just loves the gospel, and he loves Jesus, and he, uh, everything about it. So the word, the word is like the word of, um, you know, the word, the word is Christ, but the word is also, also so everything that is found in scripture as read in the tradition, you know, the, the word of God, uh, divine revelation, you know, that's the goodness of God as God reveals um, who, who he is. And, and and how much he loves us and in a concrete way god actually loves us concretely um god with us god real god with us anyway all this stuff so um the fire i always think the fire comes from the holy spirit at pentecost mm -hmm. the image that you see in the book of acts you know with with the fire um descending you know and all that from the spirit you know so word and spirit you know, the missions, the missions of, of the word and spirit, the father sends the word and, and the spirit, the divine word, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, um, you know, which comes upon the inaugurated, um, the inaugurated kingdom, the um, which is, you know, the, um, the which is Jesus messianic uh, people, you know, any, anyway, Baron loves all that stuff. And so that's, I forget though, who came up with that phrase. I think it was by Steve Grunau, who kind of helps has helped Baron a lot with um implementing uh the vision. You know, Baron's kind of a broad vision guy. And then Father Steve Grunau has helped with like nuts and nuts and bolts. So um a concluding question. Um, so for Bishop Baron, what lies at the essence of Catholicism? Well, the essence for him is is Jesus Christ. You know, um, he he has that, and and he has a book. You know, just called the Priority of Christ, and and that that really kind of shapes the vision there because, um, you know, for him, Christ is not is in fact a great teacher. Christ reveals uh, reveals the Father, reveals human destiny. Christ is also a savior. He's a warrior, like a warrior against sin and, and to liberate us from sin. You know, Christ comes um, in battle, you know, against sin and against death. You know, Christ is a, is a warrior in a way. He's a savior, you know, but, um, so he's not only a great teacher, revealer, but but a great, a great savior. And he is also, you know, Christ the king, you know, in the, um, you know, Baron, really makes a lot of that in his commentary on second Samuel, you know, like Christ is the new David, you know, and what is the job of the King, you know, the King um, job is to establish justice in, in his land and so on. Um, now much more could be said, but really for Baron, the center of everything is Christ because Christ is an incredibly exciting figure. You know, Christ, uh, his teaching is, his teaching his, um, you know, his sanctifying, like his, his the Eucharist, the, um, you know, all, all the things that he does to sanctify his priestly action, Christ is the high priest, you know, but Christ as, as sort of the king, the warrior who liberates us from sin and death, Baron has has got, got the key in a way, you know, um, the key to the whole um, beauty and, and um, excitement of being Christian. And the excitement is, is that God has sent um, his son, Jesus Christ, you know, to redeem the world. Um, and and this is, once you kind of look into it, you you really discover how incredibly exciting the whole thing is. And Baron, um, Baron's a great way to, 
his theology really can get you into that. And really, you can all you can see that Christianity, man, it's exciting. It it really involves all sorts of, uh, you know, it's not it's not beige Catholicism. It's it's incredible, you know. It's ex extremely exciting, and, and Baron often shows you how exciting it is, also by pointing not only to Christ's course, but to the but to the lives of the saints, and 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 to Catholic culture, but and Christian culture more generally also. But but the lives of the saints, once you really look into it, you see, my gosh, these people really stood up. They stood up for the poor at real sacrifice. They stood up for um, you know, beauty, for truth, for goodness. And um, they they stood up for Jesus Jesus Christ and they proclaimed him often at incredible sacrifice, but they did it out of love. And um, they devoted their lives to love, to love of God and to love of neighbor. And Baron is amazed, you know, because we all know that mo it's very easy in life to devote your life to something second rate, you know, um, just to settle, to settle, you know. But these saints are incredible, and so and and Baron Baron sees in the saints the, the concrete teaching of Jesus Christ and, and the con that concrete really following Jesus Christ, real discipleship, you know, which is really possible because of the Holy Spirit, you know. And so this this the adventure of discipleship is really the you know for Baron something that he actually lives. He actually lives the adventure of discipleship. Um, you know, uh, I mean. I find him to be himself an exemplar um, in my own experience of him. And, you know, for, he, I find him a, a very good friend in Christ. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself. Thank you very much, Professor Matthew Levering, for joining the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you.